and for me, it's not fear of failure. It's more of a fear of success. And then her question was, well, why do you fear success? What do you fear about success? It was like the responsibility that comes with, you know, when you want to get to that next level and then you work hard and you do it. Now what? Now you're a little higher or a little farther to fall. Then typically I give a disclaimer about my internet connection because we're in the van, but I'm not in the van today. So I was going to say, are okay. you in a van? Are you in the van? It looks like you're, I don't know where you are, but it looks like a room. This like is it a could room. Be a, yes. It could be a backdrop. You got to get a backdrop in the van. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got to get this <laughs> as a backdrop or like something that makes it look bigger. Well, what's, what's been cool is like, I've had a couple of episodes where I've filmed with we have two big windows in the back. I, I don't know if you saw. Obviously, you, you saw the van, but I'm not sure if you saw yes. on the back on both sides. We have two big windows, and so yes. I'll sit right in front of those windows. And like my, I think it was the set, second episode that I recorded. I was sitting with the mountains in Alaska, just sitting in oh. the background of the window. So sometimes I get some really cool shots when I'm in the van. That <clears> very being cool. In a, being in a house can't give quite the same look and feel. Yes, yes, that's that is. I think that is just like one of the coolest things ever that you guys just live in a van that is like so that is like to me the epitome one of the epitomes of, of freedom you know it's just and 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 detachment you know i mean where everybody's like oh that's probably you know the coolest thing but I, I there's no way i could do it how come well that's what everybody says now i think i could do it but I don't know for how long, you know, you get just used to, um, I'm a, I'm a creature of habit. I try not to be, but I think I'm, I'm pretty much a creature of habit and having, um, space, you know, I, it's, it's one of those things that I wouldn't say I wouldn't do it without trying to do it, you know, cause I always think I could do like the, I, we watched, uh, my husband, and I watched the tiny house. It's like, I could do tiny house. And he's like, no way. What are you going to do? We're going to do with all your, you know, it's all the stuff, you know, it's all the attachment to all the things. Um, but I think if I was forced to that, I, I could figure it out. I think I could. And, I think, it, I think well, I could. that to me is the whole thing about it is that there's, there's so many aspects of, of the lifestyle of living in a van mm -hmm. that are incredibly, they're, they're very inconvenient. And it, it's not really ideal for many reasons. But when you talk about having space or the things, like a couple of the things that I've just noticed and have been interesting are that mm -hmm. from a thing standpoint, you really become very aware and surprised at how little you actually do need on a yes. daily basis. And as far yes. as space, you know, you, you just, you find new ways and different ways to create that space or give yourself mm -hmm. the space that you need. And so we were kind of joking around before we started recording about, um, you know, having two people working from home, you and your husband, both are working from yeah. home today. And, and that, that's my wife and I's reality all the time, uh, especially yeah. when we're living in 45 <laughs> square feet together. But, you know, oh you're, you find ways to get outside and you go to coffee shops and you're in new towns. And yeah, it's, it's amazing how you can end up creating a sense of space, even when you mm -hmm. exist in something that is very small and very Absolutely. Not normal. Absolutely. And just like you were saying, you had a, a backdrop of, you know, of Alaska, you open the doors in your space uh, or mount, mountains and glaciers. I mean, forget about it. I mean, just, you know, that alone would trade off, you know, as I look at a closet full of clothes that I hardly wear, you know, maybe twice a year, you know, it's like there, we do, I collect, we, and as a society, we collect so many things that we think we need, but we don't. I mean, my husband and I were talking um, <clears throat> not too long ago about all this, this, these storage units that are popping up everywhere, like where there's space, where there's land, if it's not like, you know, a soccer complex or, you know, ginormous, um, um, these like it's a soccer complex with a baseball diamonds and indoor basketball facilities, like these huge facilities, because it always starts out as a steel structure. And then it's like, all of a sudden, you know, you storage, 
and there are the people, we just have so much stuff. And, you know, we kind of go through those purges, usually in the spring. Um, we're kind of doing one now where, um, because my uh, mother-in-law passed away in April and just kind of going through all this, all the stuff. There's so much. It's like, what, 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 what do we need this for? You know, and it kind of stems in us to, you know, to start getting rid of stuff. Like, do we want our kids to have to go through all this, you know, when the time comes? Um, but yeah, we get, we want things around us, right? We want to hold on to the attachment of whether it's the memory or, um, I mean, and I'm looking at uh, half of the stuff that I have and it's like, there's no, there's no generational, there's no generational attachment or meaning. It's like, I'm, it didn't, didn't come from generations. Um, it's just stuff that I've accumulated and I think I need. So yeah, well, you, I think it's you, pretty you, cool that you guys do that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. You, you mentioned the word detachment and, and attachment both now in, in our conversation. I, I'm curious about, tell me more about this, this idea of, of detachment and, you know, part of what you said maybe appealed to you about getting rid of some of the stuff is, is the idea of detachment. What does that kind of mean or signify for you? Yeah. Oh man. For me, it's, it's looking at maybe the, the, the comforts of life that I've gotten used to, that I've gotten comfortable with maybe that I've even begun to depend on and try to, you know, question or challenge myself and to do, I really need this. And then can I, can I detach from the, the need or the, the, the idea that I need it, you know? So for me, um, detachment is really challenging all of my attachments that I can, that I recognize that I have. Um, oh, there's just so many kind of things kind of swirling through my mind right now and things that I'm working on. Obviously I just came back from retreat um, that I got to spend so much wonderful time with your amazing wife. And you know that, you know, she's amazing, right? You're married to her, <laughs> but just uh, to say that she's absolutely a, a amazing. <laughs> um, and to have the opportunity to meet you there briefly, obviously it was a women's only retreat, so you couldn't stay. But um, yeah, well, just just to uh, to to uh, bring in our listeners, it's just amazing how the the world works sometimes. Um, so yes. I, I was I was introduced to Kimberly through Kelly McMullen, who I had on the podcast a couple episodes ago. If you haven't listened to that episode, I would mm -hmm. encourage you to do so. so. And at the at the end of my episodes, I typically ask my guests, I say, "Who is someone that you know that I should have on the show?" And Kelly mentioned your name. She mentioned you. And so um, as, as, as Kimberly and I were, were going through the scheduling process, then I was dropping my wife off at this retreat that Kimberly was talking about that I just rudely interrupted. But um, I, I got to, and then all of a sudden, as we're pulling in, I'm, I'm dropping my wife off. And she says, oh, that's Kimberly. And I, I jumped out and I said, oh my gosh, Kimberly. You know, and it was Yay! just so cool to be able to actually meet you in person before because we do all of these recordings virtually. I just thought that was such a cool yes. moment. And it's always amazing to me how, how the universe works. So anyway, I, yes. I just wanted to th throw that in there to give people context that we actually did get the chance to meet a few days ago, uh, yes. but we did not know each other previously. Yes, yes. And that, and that was um, super cool. And it was just, it was cool to know that you were tall. I had no idea. You know, you don't know what people, you don't know what people are. <laughs> There's so many times like kind of through COVID where everything, like we did a lot of stuff online. I did, I started yoga teacher training, my 300 hour, I have my 200 hour certification, but I started yoga teacher training, the 300 hour um, through citizen yoga, which is what I'm almost finished with. I'm so excited. Um, but it was all online. and then you know, COVID settled and there was a retreat in Tulum and um, I went on that retreat and that was the first time I met everybody in person. They were like, oh my gosh, you're tall. <laughs> we had no idea. You've only been on the screen. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're so tiny. I had no idea. You know? So yeah, those, those kind of things are special and I love how the universe does work, but um, I, I don't know what we were, we were talking about. Well, with okay. The, so, um, so the tell retreat. us more about the retreat experience, because since my wife Eileen has come back, she and I have yes. been having tons of conversations and 
you know, it was a really, really impactful experience for her. And so I've got to imagine yes. you probably had a similar experience. Tell me about some of what maybe happened or, or came up for you during this retreat process. Yeah. So, so man, it was, it was transformative. It was such an amazing experience. And I came at it from a slightly different, different, um, you know, perspective. Um, I was going as a, um, as a practitioner, I do Thai massage. And so I'm a body worker, um, in addition to being a yoga instructor, but I was going to be a provider and people would sign up and, you know, ha handle services. Well, the way they did the scheduling, which was, you know, pretty brilliant, um, and very intentional, um, was that providers could also take part in the retreat in the classes and most of the experiences we were, you know, we were able to do. Um, and during the free time is when we would do, you know, practice and do, do our services and hold space for people. And I really wasn't aware of that. I, I was thinking that, you know, I'll just go, I'll be too tired. I'm going to, I'm going to be, you know, I use my body for what I do for other people. And I was like, there's just no way I'll have the capacity or the energy to do both. Well, I did. I had the energy and the capacity and, and, and it was amazing. It was exhausting, but I am still processing so much. So I'm doing, I've had a lot of conversations with my husband, with a couple friends. I've done a lot of journaling and I'm, I'm still processing so much, but I think one of, um, one of the biggest things, oh, there's so many big things. I can't say one of the biggest things, but one of the things that, um, came up in this, in this retreat, and that's why it's so important, I think, to connect and share is that, um, one of the gals was, you know, we were in a sharing circle and she mentioned that, she wanted to have bring more intention in her life instead of perfection. And I think we all strive for perfection. And I think I, I spend more time trying to get things perfect versus putting special intention behind it. Um, and, and that was one of those things that was kind of jarring. It's like, you know, I'm, I get a little OCD. There's certain things, you know, with the dishes, they have to be done as soon as dinner's done. You know, I'm doing dishes during, you know, during dinner so that the kitchen can be clean and, and then I can finally relax. But there's always something extra that comes in to trying to, to trying to make something perfect where I could just be spending time either chatting with my husband or sitting on the couch, just taking, taking time to take rest. I think because I think as a society, and I think, you know, women in particular, I can speak for, because I am one, is that we want things so perfect that we're spending unnecessary time trying to achieve that perfection when it's just the intention. I mean, my husband appreciates that I cook dinner. Why can't that be enough for me? but I want it to be perfect. I want it to be clean. The counter's wiped off, everything bleached, and then ready for the next day. So that's maybe a half an hour a day that I spend extra on perfection where my intention can be so much better served, spending time having a conversation with him, whether it random or, you know, I mean, and he's very self-sufficient, so it's not like he needs it but to just have that, you know, deeper connection. Um, so that was something that, that really um, resonated. And it kind of became the theme, not the theme, but one of the underlying, it, we talked about it all the time, just that remembering to be, it's, it's the intention behind it and not trying to be so, so, you know, perfect. Yeah. As, as you look at this, desire to be perfect this this tendency towards mm -hmm. perfection what do you think it is that's behind it for you that that leads you to to want to take this extra time to do all these extra things to show up a certain way or to have things a certain way what's what's behind that for you mm. i think 
from Mm, that's that's a really good question. I think that probably started to stem. I mean, I'm sure it's probably something that I've had since uh, since childhood, but it wasn't like I was trying to be perfect in school. I wasn't trying to be, um, it came more for athletics. I'm, um, I was an athlete. Um, still am an athlete. I'm still an athlete. We always say I used to be an athlete. I'm still an athlete. <clears throat> if you've done a Kelly McMullen class, you're an athlete. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, <laughs> a Kelly McMullen class, particularly a release class, but do even a fusion. You're you you are a athlete. Um, you're an athlete. Um, but I think it came from probably my time in athletics. I I played three or four sports in in high school, so I had the luxury of being able to be a a multi sport athlete. Where nowadays, um, unfortunately, kids and my son included, he's 19 years old. But when he was in school, he kind of had to choose what sport and he did basketball and he did soccer and he ended up choosing soccer. And that was, you know, by middle school so that you could keep up. And then it was year round. And, but anyway, um, I was a, a four sport athlete and I got to choose what sport I went to college to play. Cause I was, I was recruited for basketball and softball and volleyball and I ended up choosing volleyball and um, got an opportunity to play division one athletics um, at Western Go Broncos, Western Michigan University, Go Broncos, um, who are having an amazing season this year as well. I think they're 11 and 0. But um, I think it started there, per perfection. I had a lot of natural ability, God given ability. Um, thank you for family, for DNA, um, for all of, all of those things. And when I got to college, I had this realization that <clears throat> I didn't just walk into the room. <clears throat> excuse me. I didn't just walk into the room and win anymore. I wasn't always the tallest. Um, I was always the tallest in high school. Very rarely was there anyone taller than me. I'm, I'm six one. And with shoes on, I think I may, you know, you know, with shoes on, you do that. We do that way. We, we bump it up a couple a more. Bit. Yeah. 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 A couple more. Um, and when I went to Western, the way, the way it, it worked there and I was a red shirt, I was a freshman because I came from a, <laughs> not a very solid volleyball background in high school. Cause our, our coach was an aerobics instructor, <laughs> but I ended up playing club. So that's what got me exposure, um, with volleyball to Western. So they saw an athlete and they saw potential and then trained the technique. Um, when I got to Western, they did numbers based on height. So there was the captain and then it was tallest to shortest. And that's how you were numbered. I was number six. And I'm like, oh, oh <laughs> these girls are huge. So my God-given talent wasn't enough. And um, the coaching staff, you know, I had access to all of this. There was the weight room. There was the strength and conditioning. Nutrition wasn't that wasn't really talked about much, but we did body fat and, and training. And I started to realize that if I took my, you know, what I already had and what I already did just naturally, and then added all of these techniques, the speed, the agility, um, the extra work, I would come in early and then stay late and do the aerodyne bike sprints and, you know, all those things, because, you know, I believe that I had the potential to, to go beyond collegiate volleyball. And that became a desire for me. And then I think that was where I kind of started developing this perfection. I had to do this many sprints. I had to do, you know, I had to lift this many weights and I could be stronger than anybody else. And this, so, it was more of a competitive thing, but I think that's what kind of started my whole like perfection. Like I do these things and I will get this and I will be at this level. Um, Cause we played at a, at a high level. We had like the mid American conference streak. I think it was like 132 wins in a row or, you know, something like that. I might still be oh, a wow. record holder. Yeah, it might still be a record holder, but it was like kind of that that um, competitive. I com that it's just this competitive. It just it was something that I always had, and then when I was able to put 
um, work to what came natural, it just kind of sparked something. And I'm, that's where kind of where my my need or desire for perfectionism started, if that makes sense. It so does. I kind of think about it and trace back to, I haven't talked about these kind of things and like, geez, I don't know if ever or in a long, long time, but. No, it, it's great. I mean, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. I'm, I'm really curious about you. You mentioned in this process of going from high school to collegiate volleyball. Um, mm -hmm. You said, I couldn't just walk into the room and win anymore. And yeah. I've got to imagine that that there's got to be some, some more behind that. Tell us about what that feeling was like, because mm -hmm. from what I'm hearing, it sounds like through high school, you had the height, you had the athleticism that you could essentially just show up and, and you would just win. It was just sort of a given yeah. thing. And then that stopped. What was that process yes. like for you? It was it was very humbling. You know, it's kind of one of those things where. You know, you just got to you get your ass kicked. It's like I could, I could, I, I realized how little skill I had. And even though, you know, it's division one, it was Western Michigan University. It was such a big deal. You know, it was always in the newspapers, um, in high school with, so I was a, um, I was a swimmer, which as a black girl was not very popular back in the eighties. I graduated in 88. So in middle school, I was on the Aquacats and I joined the Aquacats because I had, um, oh, geez, I'm going back. Um, my, my mom wasn't a teacher, grew up in a single parent home. It was myself and my sister. I have an older sister. And we would camp every summer and go to KOA camps because that was, you know, they had the, they had the, uh, so, so yeah, I could, I could live in a van. We used to do a pop-up yeah. camper. So it, yeah, yeah. I, I got that. I got that in my, in my history. Um, <clears throat> but we would go to KOA camps because they had pools, they had playgrounds, you know, it was just these, you know, these great safe places. And we were at a camp and we were playing around the pool and I didn't, I hadn't had swimming lessons yet. I didn't know how to swim. And we were playing in the pool and this guy was throwing kids in and just, you know, kind of launching kids in. They were all having fun. And well, he grabbed me and threw me in. And I'm like, as I'm flying through the air and going into the water, I'm like, I can't swim. Now, I don't remember if the water was even over my head, if it was deep, but I remember treading water. <laughs> And when I looked at my mom and I saw it come out of her mouth, she can't swim. I immediately realized I can't swim and I went underwater. So fast forward. I, I didn't dr drown, obviously, but, you know, I had the freak out and I was, you know, crying. And, and I ended up joining this, getting swim lessons and joining the swim team. And I wanted to be the best swimmer ever. I'm walking through the school and it was my freshman year and I'm on the swim team and, you know, I'm always the only, you know, the only black person there every now and then there was another one. Um, I love swimming. And as I'm walking through the halls at school, a basketball coach comes up to me and says, why aren't you playing basketball? Like, Oh, I swim and it's the same season. So I can't. Well, apparently, um, uh, one of the boys that I was dating and a few other people, the coach knew that were, you know, on the team, he got them to start working on me to join the basketball team. And I'm like, I don't know anything about basketball. I don't even know how, you know, the steps you got to take and dribbling and which I never figured out and, and free throws were not my thing. But somehow they convinced me my sophomore year, I, I walked onto the court and I played and I was going to join the basketball team. I didn't know anything about basketball. This is a long, <laughs> a long story to say that I walked on the court and they put the ball in my hands and kind of gave me direction on what to do, you know, where, where to, where to, you know, where to put the ball and, and I did well without really knowing what I was doing because I was tall. I could just, you know, reach up and I was one of the, I think, lead rebounders and we did really well and, um, you know, made it to regionals and 
you know, so I end up playing for three years and I, you know, obviously I didn't dribble. I was a center <laughs> dribbling was not my thing. It was boxing out. It was rebounding. It was putbacks. Right. And I went from swimming and understanding everything about swimming to basketball, knowing nothing about basketball and, and, and being able to be successful. And basically it was for showing up. I mean, I did the practices. I never missed practices. I was committed to practices. We ran sprints. You know, I remember twisting my ankle because I had shitty shoes because it didn't, you know, we didn't know. Um, and my mom was a single parent as well. But so having that experience gave me like a, I mean, a, a false sense of, of, of security, a false sense of um, ability. I, I don't, I, I mean, I think back and I, I don't think I um, didn't work hard in practice. So it wasn't like I was just showing up and, you know, give me the ball. Um, our team worked hard, but I was still able to walk in and be successful. Um, I walked into a lot of rooms and grabbed attention just because of my size. And um, my sister and I, um, we were on a forensics team. So we did a lot of speech competition and we were good. We were good. She did poetry. I did prose duo with my, we won state, you know, huh. so we, again, we did put in the work, but we walked in and we won. Um, just walking through the door in a lot of places, either scored some points right away. Um, you know, so there was kind of that intimidation factor. Um, and walking into Western, it was like, welcome, number six. You know, walk in as number one, <laughs> you know? So that was, it was very humbling. It was very eye-opening. It was, and it was very much, and I was a red shirt. Um, they 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 redshirted me, and that was going to be part of the plan. So I did everything the team did. I dressed, I warmed up, but the minute competition start, I stayed on the sidelines, and that was very eye opening for me because I'm like, I know if I got in there, I could do this. Um, but you know, coach was very smart, and I had four years to come back of eligibility, and two of those years I was able, you know, I was the captain, and um, you know, had the opportunity. But again put in the work for that level of perfection. Um, that That's where that changed in college. It's like, you, you know, I've worked hard to get to the level and to be able to play at the level and experience the level that, that I did. Um, so it was more than just showing up once I went to college. And that's probably kind of, that's continued. That, that's continued. Whereas yeah, I'm, I'm curious perfection. about that sort of um, continuation in your life or, or what you took or learned from that experience, because I can really resonate with that. I mean, it, for mm -hmm. me, it wasn't so much athletically. It was more, I guess, with, with my brain, so to speak, but going through middle school and high school and college, essentially, I could just kind of rely on the fact that like, well, I was, I was smart. And, and I could kind of walk into situations that I wasn't familiar with and, and I could always just kind of bet on myself and, mm. and rely on the fact that I can learn quickly, I can adapt. And that got me through a lot of situations in life where, like you said, it's not that I didn't put in effort, but mm -hmm. I also didn't have to work extra hard. I didn't have to do a lot of preparation and I could just kind of skate by um, and, and, mm -hmm. and do really well. And mm -hmm. then... You know, for me, it was once I got into my professional career and especially once I decided to go on my own and explore entrepreneurship that I was kind of awakened to the idea that, you know, I, I can't just walk into every situation anymore and have mm -hmm. people immediately based on interacting with me or whatever. I, I wasn't guaranteed success any longer. And yes. that was that was kind of hard for me because I mm -hmm. felt like that was something I could always rely on and something I could always bet on. And then I had to go through this experience of sort of relearning, well, what, what can I place my self-worth and my self-value in? And so I'm yeah. curious how, how that experience has impacted you in the rest of your life. Yes. Yeah. That that's 
that's a good question and 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 a, and a good point and um yeah because i too you know i'm an i'm an entrepreneur i i'm kimberly's yoga and more i mean that's it's just me i don't you know i don't have a have a staff um or anybody to i have lots of support but there's that thing in and i've always played team sports i've never done individual sports where it's not just me, right? It wasn't just me. You know, the pass wasn't perfect. The set was off a little bit. I can only do what I can do. Um, so there's a, a level of, I mean, not comfort with the team, but there's not that when you're on a tennis court, it's just you and the other person, right? Um, right. And I'd never been in that type of a situation. I always had the team support, you know, I can only do so much. I need the, you know, this, what the speed of the leader is the speed of the team, right? Or you're as uh, um, strong as your weakest link, right? So it wasn't anything that ever fell on me. And, you know, I graduated from college and went into the business world. So I was in um, corporate America. I've done a little bit of everything. I mean, I've, I've been um, worked in hospice. I've worked in the automotive industry on the auction end, the wholesale auction end. I've worked on the, the retail end, car dealerships, um, from finance to sales. Um, and I've done the travel business. Um, but when I stepped out on my own, that was where I think a lot of, and that's things that I'm still processing is things that I'm still dealing with where fear started to set in. It's like, can I, can I, can I fly on my own? Um, one of the things that I talked with, um, chatted a little bit with Kelly about at the retreat is she, she asked me, she goes, what is it that keeps you from shining so bright? As bright, you know, as bright as you can. And I, it's fear. And for me, it's not fear of failure. It's more of a fear of success. And then her question was, well, why do you fear success? What do you fear about success? It was like the responsibility that comes with, you know, when you want to get to that next level and then you work hard and you do it. Now what? Now you're a little higher or a little farther to fall. Um, and, and I'm kind of still processing that. But I do understand that that fear that comes in isn't my voice. At the speaking inside of me, it's it's a it's a different voice. It's not mine. It's maybe the voice of my mom when she said, "I was swimming. I was I was staying afloat, and I saw her say she can't swim." And then I kind of said, "Yeah, I can't swim. I went underwater." You know, is it is it the voice of our ancestors? It's it's the voice of um, those people that maybe we're in my life at the time, I'm going to go play volleyball. Oh, you're going to go play that sport. Or I was in swimming. That's a white sport. I was in volleyball. That's a white sport. You need to play basketball. That's a black sport. Um, you know, so that stepping out on my own, all of those type of, of, of voices and feelings kind of started, you know, that's, that's what was in me. That's what was coming up. And that's what I feel like is not kept me because I feel like I've done an amazing job. And, you know, when you look on paper, it's successful, but, it, you know, not quite where, you know, I, I want to be yet. I'm, I'm not done yet. You know, I'm not, I'm not done yet. So those are the, you know, those are the things that do you go to retreats for, right? You go to, to, to coaching and mentoring for that, that, you know, you talk about on podcasts, right? Is when you verbalize things is, is, it, it, it makes it real. And then there's accountability. And I think I do better. I know I do better with accountability. If I can get up and I don't have any plans for the day, the day can pass by and I'm like, hmm, the day's done, you know, but to have that, you know, that level of that level of accountability. Okay. I got to do it. That's one of the reasons I got into fitness. Is because I wasn't doing it on my own. Once once college ended, 
you know, we worked out every day. We had phases. We had in preseason, three a days, um, all the things, right? All the structure, all the, 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 the responsibility. You do this, you, you do this. This is the outcome. Th this is what happens. Well, when that ended, it was just kind of like, I don't have to do it anymore. But then if you're eating as much as you were, you know, all the things, right? You know, you're shape, you're loose, you're out of shape and everything happens. So when I was looking at doing something, in addition, when I was in the you know corporate world, um, uh, and I was like starting to look, I've always been like a side hustle. I've been a side hustle girl. I, I always got side hustles. Um, I said, well, I can do, you know, make extra money bartending or waitressing, you know, something in customer service. And I'm like looking at all these things and I'm like, wait a minute. If I do something in the fitness world, then, then I have a responsibility. Like people are showing up for my classes. So I was, I started doing some jazzercise classes that were local. I was living in Allegan. It was a previous marriage. Um, it was after the birth of my son. I was just like, okay, I, I need to lose some weight. I need to, and I, doing it on my own wasn't working. Um, and so I was started going to these jazzercise classes and I was having the best time of my life. And the instructor was talking about, you know, there's certifications coming up. You should come be a teacher for me. I'm like, I can't teach people. It's like, I'm not a teacher. My mom was a teacher. I was like, Bleh. I'm not going to, never going to be an educator. It wasn't too long ago that I realized that I am an educator, by the way, um, just in a different way, not in a classroom format. But right. so I was like, okay, I can do this. This is great. I had a team. I had a group of people at this little group, you know, and I'd always be in my same spot and I'd have two girls on my side and, you know, the one in front that I'd follow. And, you know, it just felt so good. Um, so it's like, okay, I can get certified to do this because people show up for the class and I got to teach it and I got to practice the moves. So again, there was that level of, 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 of responsibility, accountability. Um, and that's kind of what I needed to, to be where I am today. And still I teach yoga classes. People show up for my classes. I have to prepare, I have to be, you know, you know, ready. Um, and it forces me to stay on track. And that's just, that's me. Some people, God love them, can do, do it on their own. I, I can't. I even did triathlons, which I guess is an individual sport, but we always trained as a team. I was never by myself. I was never in the water by myself. You know, I was always worried about what if I get a cramp and drown? I'm like, well, I'm not going to be first. <laughs> and the goal is to, you know, not be last. But, um, you know, there were always kind of people around. So I kind of, you know, I'm just that team oriented kind of kind of person. That's where I draw the most energy from the most comfort from. Um, so yeah, breaking off into the entrepreneurial world. Ooh, it's, it's scary. It the is scary. spotlight is on you now, right? Yes. And, and you don't necessarily yes. have that team. I, I want to go back to this. You know, I, I really appreciate you sharing about the fear of success because mm. I, I think oftentimes a lot of people can associate with the fear of failure and maybe we, yeah. We often think that we're afraid of failure, but mm -hmm. I'm, I, I, I tend to think, and if I really diagnose myself and the things that I'm afraid of, I actually think it does tend to be that I'm more afraid of the success and what that might mean as opposed yes. to the failure. And I wonder if that might be the case for a lot of people. You mentioned the word responsibility with it and mm -hmm. that in, in being afraid of your success that was going to bring additional responsibility and i'm i'm curious if you know is there an element of you've talked about as a as a black woman that you you went into swimming even though that was a sport where people were like what why why are you doing that and you yeah. <laughs> you you chose to go some of these paths that were different and i i came across something that you had written um i think it was earlier this year about being a black woman in yoga and in the yoga world. And, mm -hmm. and here you are again, choosing a sort of different path. That's not the traditional path. Is there, as we talk about fear and we talk about responsibility, mm -hmm. is there an element of being a black woman in a space that is not traditionally 
where black people are. Is that part of mm-hmm. this responsibility that you feel or fear that you feel with the success that you might have? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, it's, um, these realms and these worlds that I've kind of found myself in initially have got me there because of, you know, I almost drowned. I didn't want that to happen again. I wanted to learn how to swim. So I got swim lessons and then there's like, oh, aqua cats, let's join that swim team so I can be better at it. Yoga found me at a time I've been practicing for 27 years. Like I do, you know, since college, you know, a a part of our um, training, um, I I stumbled onto some yoga classes that, that, you know, were cool. It's like, oh, this is cool. I can handle this. I I can, this is something I can do. Um, Especially when I was kind of getting back into fitness, maybe a little bit more. Um, I was like, oh, I can hang with these ladies. Side note, my first jazzercise class that I ever took, I was like, all these old ladies, it's like, oh, I got this. Because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a past athlete. I, I puked. I like <laughs> literally puked after a jazzercise class. <laughs> and I'm like, what just happened? One um, of those uh, sneaky workouts. Sneaky. Yeah. It's like, the you know, the jump there, just dancing, having fun with their little leg warmers. They were still wearing leg warmers when I started. Um, but yeah, so... When, when yoga circled back around and found me, I just um, ended a marriage um, of 16 years and moved to Kalamazoo with my son because I wanted him to have more diversity. I found a studio through Groupon. I needed to save money. You know, I was now on my own income wise um, and went to the studio. And when I walked in the door, I felt so welcome. And I also realized that there were no black people there. It was a hot yoga studio. And I'm like, what's where you, I understood why. Um, This was in Portage, which is an area that is not predominantly black versus Kalamazoo, which is where I do some other work in now. But I felt so incredibly welcome there fell in love with the practice, fell in love with the heat because it was a hot yoga studio and they did the sequence, their signature sequence where you do it's the same poses, same flow. But every time I went, it was different. The instructor was different. The music was different. The message was different. My body's response was different. I got hooked. And the more time I spent at the studio, the more I kind of started thinking, I was like, I got to get, I, there's got, I got to get some black people here. They need to experience this. What was it that um, made you feel so welcome and so comfortable? If if you looked around and you didn't see anyone that looked like you, but yet it felt different, it felt comfortable. What what was that? It was the response of the staff and the employees. I've walked into studios before, and I always go whenever I travel. I try different studios and I just walk in, I sign up or don't sign up. I walk in, I don't announce I'm Kimberly. I'm a yoga instructor and I'm from, you know, I don't do that. I just walk in like a regular person. And the majority of the time I am greeted with, are, it, is there something I can help you with? Well, yeah, I'm here for a fucking yoga class. What, why else would, what else would you be helping me with? I'm not here to sell anything. You know, it's like, are you, are you, do you, do you know that this is a yoga? You know what I mean? Just that that's what I'm greeted with a lot. Um, or, you know, can I help you? <laughs> Instead of like, welcome, you're here for yoga. Have you ever been here before? You know, I haven't seen you. Have you been here before? And, and that, that welcoming in made me feel like this is, this is a place for me. And it immediately became my home. Um, but so many black people wouldn't just walk into a studio, especially in a predominantly white town. And it's a hot yoga studio. You know, we, we're, we're very, the black population, especially black female, are very particular about our hair. We get our hair done and I, it can't be getting sweat. It can't, it can't get wet. 
we don't, you know, the, 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 there's just things that don't happen. And, 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 and hot yoga <laughs> is one of those things. It's um, hot. It's hot. Um, and, uh, but the, I think in, in my upbringing and how I was raised, my grandparents were entrepreneurs. They were very involved in, in um, and these are my mom's parents and, and raising us um, because again, my mom was an educator and, and she worked. But growing up in the town that I grew up in, in Albion, it was, just, it was a great mix. It was a really, really good mix um, of black, white, Hispanic. So I never, even though I was the only one most of the time on the swim team, I never felt singled out okay. because of it. I'm sure if I look back or if I think back or if I, you know, think back that, you know, that there was, you know, maybe, you know, microaggressions or something or people that, just, you know, didn't know my hair was in braids and I would swim. They're on a swim cap like everybody else and swim. Um, in the yoga space, it's the same thing. You throw your hair up, you get on your mat and you move and you breathe and you pay attention to what's happening inside. That doesn't matter if you're black or white or brown. It's the same. And being in this world, in this realm, has been life-changing, life-affirming, life-saving for me. And, and I, my whole goal, one of my goals, one of my goals, is to break that stigma that it's not for Black people as well. That we can't experience this settling of the nervous system, this feeling of community, this, um, all the things that, that happen from just walking through the door and arriving on your mat, but to get to, so to get to the door, right? I think you have to have a certain kind of mindset, like, I don't give a shit. I don't, I don't care. Yeah. What it's, anybody it's intimidating. Does. It's very intimidating though. But once you get in the door, I think that whoever's at the front desk or whoever, whatever teacher is out greeting people that, you know, having that, just that welcoming is something so simple, a smile, welcome, welcome to class. My name's whatever, what's your name versus can I, can I help you? Is there something I can help you with? You know what I mean? It's just something that simple. It's like, well, yeah, I'm here to here to take you. What else would I be here? Um, that's one of my goals is to change that. Yeah, tell me more about that. What does that look like for, you know, what are some of your efforts in particular, or, or how can I guess like what does that change look like? The the yoga community as a whole. How can mm -hmm. how can that community be more ex accepting of black people, brown people, mm -hmm. anyone? Um, yeah. What does that actually look like to you? So to me, it looks like, and I, you know, I, I, you know, there's so many that I follow, and it's and it is changing. It's not, you know, there's studios, there's a couple studios and a few studios in Detroit. One I'm affili affiliated with, one I trained at, um, that are making a a big a big difference. So for me, it's, it's being on a larger scale yoga wise, whether it's online, whether it's, you know, teaching workshops, being visible. I do, um, one of the things that's just my, my baby that I'm so, so incredibly proud of is a program in Kalamazoo that my girlfriends and I started and she's a master's of social work. Um, and counseling and therapy and working on her PhD. And her sister is an RN and recently board certified nurse practitioner in um, psychotherapy and myself. 
yoga instructor, mindfulness instructor, trauma informed. We all got together and kind of started thinking, what can we do for the youth? Where where can we change? Um, her her name is Valerie, and she owns a synergy center in um, Kalamazoo Synergy Health Center. And her whole thing when she started this this organization, it's in the north side of Kalamazoo, which is a predominantly black side of Kalamazoo. It is the north side of the tracks in Kalamazoo. Um, is breaking the stigma in mental health in the black and brown community. There is a huge stigma in mental health. We don't we don't even be telling people your business. You keep that mm. quiet. You can go to the preacher. But, you know, then you're not really trusting that they're not keeping secrets. Um, but you don't be talking to people about stuff. You, 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 no, 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 no. You, you don't do that. So there's that. And then there's the people that are available to talk to. Don't look like me. So that's not. It's, there's so many barriers to get through. For you to understand where I'm coming from. Just because of the color of my skin. Right. All the things that we, you know, we have to endure. We, you know, we, we we've been through. We experience. Um, so there's that too. So that's her whole goal is breaking the stigma. So like, well, how do we bring both worlds? Because there's a stigma with yoga too. They think me. You know, one of the first things that I do, especially when I'm um, working with black and brown community, is one of the first things I say when I introduce myself is yoga is not a religion. It is a practice. It's a practice huh. of awareness. And then it's like collectively, like the whole room, like, oh, okay. Cause like when we're talking about the yoga stuff, you know, they talk in different languages and we, we, we don't do that. Um, so, um, why is it important for you to distinguish that it's not a religion? Tell me more about that. Because it's not. And with the black community, if it's something that looks like a religion, they're going to shun it. So then I'm never going to be able to get into that community or to that household to show them how much stress resilience I can teach them by something as simple as breath work and meditation or a yoga pose. Every yoga pose that we do activates and stimulates the vagus nerve. Which oh, don't even get me started. I'm, I'll, I'll nerd out about the vagus nerve and just the calming effects of the nervous system. You know, when you're operating in fight or flight all the time, disease begins to set in. I mean, you, when you can't take a collective breath or a settling breath to just soften, to just let go. I mean, just imagine the the generations and the generations of people that have not experienced the practice of yoga. That's what keeps me going. So we started a program called Mind Health Ambassadors, and we train ninth through twelfth grade boys and girls. Black and brown is our focus. Everybody is welcome, though. Um, we teach them mental health awareness and mindfulness. So I do mindfulness through the movement and practice of yoga. So we're arming them with tools, clinical and holistic, to be conduits in their school. So they become ambassadors. They are not therapists. They, we don't, they don't treat anybody. But they have this whole thing of tools like, I understand. I know what this kind I know what social anxiety is. I know what PTSD is. I know what depression is. I understand, you know, suicide. You know, we have modules. and then. I'm bringing in and teaching them how to how to soothe the nervous system, how to increase stress resilience, how to balance and how to how to tap in to understand the sensations that are happening in my body and and what the result of that is. Right. I'm trying to make them more response versus reaction, reactionary. Um, so we do this. We've done this six month program. We got a grant. <clears throat> my girlfriend Valerie is amazing at writing grants. Literally, uh, it's just it's like magic. Um, we got a grant for a two year program, and so we've done it two years, and we just got renewed for three more years for this Mind Health Ambassador program. And wow, it has been just the most amazingly rewarding thing. You know, I walk into the room. I have a yoga instructor. They've never seen anybody like me that does yoga. 
I mean, social media, I think to a certain extent helps, you know, because you can search like, you know, black yoga teachers and you can get, you know, you can, you can get stuff, but to have them right in front of you and teaching you and, you know, I mean, it, from the music to, I mean, my playlist, I got to say are pretty, pretty badass, but it's <laughs> not like you're, you're what I think a lot of people perceive yoga as, you know, I'm, um, I'm a little more boot campish with my yoga. And that's of course why I love the space so much. Um, a little more, um, you know, push, push right to that edge because that's when you're going to start finding out. Um, that's when things are going to start coming up that, that we can, we can work through with, with breath work and, and understanding. Um, so, and, and on the mental health side, we have black therapists. So the kids in this program get therapy, whether it's weekly or biweekly. Therapy is part of the program. They don't have to pay for this program. So it's grant based. They don't have to pay for this program. Um, so they get therapy so they can experience it. So they can talk firsthand about it. Um, and if they already have a therapist, then they can continue to see that therapist. And we do like um, an, an assessment um, as part of the grant. Um, they get exposed. We do a yoga studio experience. So we go to my home studio. They do, you know, and it's always that transition where they close it down for us, but there's still a class getting out. So they're seeing, you know, all these people kind of come and go. Um, but they have the experience of walking up to and into a studio being welcomed, just welcome, not, not singled out or, or catching somebody off guard because it's like, oh, you know, what are you, what are you, what are you, what are you can I, can I help you? Um, so they have this experience. So that takes, you know, some of that, um, the, the, that edge off or that assumption takes away some of that assumption. Um, they get financial literacy because they get a $500 award at the end of this program. Financial literacy is again, something that there's a stigma uh, in the black community about, you know, I mean, Grandparents buried money in the backyard and put it in mattresses and under the mattress. You know, that's where all the important documents stayed. Um, you know, so we are exposing them to, I mean, not just the mental health and the mindfulness. When I, and I guess it, I, I, I guess it is this mindfully living in all areas of your life. And that's, that's one of the things that I try to teach how to listen mindfully, eat mindfully, sit mindfully, you know, all, all the things to, to integrate into life, but we're giving them all these tools that will never be taken away because they have the knowledge behind it now. They've experienced it. Like I'm very, our, our, we practice. We practice all different kinds of breath work. We practice all different kinds of movement. And they always know, you know, Miss KT, <laughs> she's got, it. it's Miss KT's turn. We always start with mental health and we end with mindfulness. So then they can work through a lot of the difficult subjects and things that that are about mental health it's not comfortable it's it's not comfortable but the more we talk about it the more we normalize it the better it's going to be so we have 30 ambassadors this year i think the first year we started we had we had 15 and then ended up graduating we you know we lose the through fruition you know we we lose some um this year we we lost, we're very strict I mean, this is a job for them and we have high expectations. Um, so if they miss, they either have to have a good reason, there's makeup work, there's, you know, all, all these things because we cover really important content and we meet three times a week. Um, so we don't take up all of their time um, and it's 10 hours a month. So um, they have this experience and then we end the experience with a retreat. We take them on a retreat. We get a coach nice transportation. I mean, this is like high end. We go to this beautiful lake house, um, south of Kalamazoo and it's on a private lake and we have a chef that cooks all of our meals for us. So these kids are pampered. And then there, and then during that, um, retreat, we do yoga every morning of course. And then they're working on projects to integrate mindfulness and mental health into their schools. How, wow. what makes sense to them? You know what I mean? What would be meaningful to them? It's not us telling them what we want them to do, but they come up with their own program. And then we have the resources from the grant 
and the connections to support them in that. So that's what's just so exciting. And then past ambassadors become mentors to the new ambassadors training. So we have um, one in particular, but you know, we have one that was a past ambassador that is very much involved in, in being a mentor and working and getting paid um, to assist us in this program right now. And so we just want it to just get exponential. We're making a generational impact. We're making a, you know, an impact in schools. Um, and this is kind of, this is just a brainchild that um, we came up with. Um, I want to say 2020, or we started talking about 2019 and then COVID happened, but, which was a blessing in disguise because that gave us so much time to like get the details and get the grants. And, you know, um, so it's been an amazing, amazing program. Hopefully I haven't rambled on too much about it, but it, it has been life changing for me and seeing these um, kids that need so much support, mental health and mindfully that just didn't know where to go or didn't know what to do. So acting out, that's a trauma response, right? It's just, it's a, it's a response. So, you know, why are they getting in trouble? Why are there so many fights? There's, you know, one of the schools that we're very, very involved in that we get most of our kids from, they have an average of like three, I think 3.5 fights a day, a day. Um, so where else can we make the impact? And we're working on an accelerated program, which is like a week immersion of our ambassador program that, um, we need to really capture this program starts when school starts. So it starts in fall. So we lose football, soccer, cross country and, and wrestling. And those, I mean, those are the kids we're trying to get, you right. know, those athletes that have all of the, the, you know, the social pressures, academic pressures, add athletics too. You know, so we're trying to do an accelerated summer program so that we can capture those, you know, or how do we cater this program to get, you know, for that, for athletes that we're missing in the time that this program runs. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's been a labor of love. And that's one of the, one of the things that for me is expanding <clears throat> that stigma. It, debunking the stigma and mental health and mindfulness. And so we're starting with teenagers, but their parents buy in and then their parents share. So it becomes a generational impact. Um, we, the newest thing that we, that just happened, um, I found out is that we got a grant for me to conduct yoga teacher trainings for past ambassadors that are interested wow. in being yoga instructors. So I get, I get to give 10 scholarships to black and brown boys and girls, young men, young women, sorry, I don't like to be called boys and girls, um, to teens that are going to learn and get certified as a yoga and meditation instructor. And again, that's something that they have that they can always use to make an income, to, 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 to build uh, an, an empire if they decide, you know, but, and, and the more that I can certify or that I can, um, inspire, the more normal it becomes. So if I can take 10 and have 10 little black and brown, black and brown yoga instructors that can go out and teach and show that, yeah, we're here. We do this too. And then they can attract more people and then they can attract more people. So for me, that's how it begins to change. But there's a lot of pressure in being that, that light, that leader in the area that I'm in. And that's where fear starts to set in. And it's like, oh, there's Absolutely. no team. This is just me. What if it doesn't work? You know, what if, you know, uh, you know, so that's, that's where it is. That's where it is for me. That's where I see the biggest change happening. And this um, program that we've been doing has been 
amazing. And it's been, it has been amazing and it's growing. People are hearing about, we're getting, we're, we, you know, we always find out, how'd you hear about our program? We do marketing and, you know, oh, we heard about this from like Jeter's leaders. And we're like, oh, well, we need to make sure that, you know, we, you know, that we're, we're, we're staying connected with them because they've, you know, given us, you know, quite a few students and leaders. And we're like, this is amazing. So we're just growing. We're in the very beginning. It was just kind of like, what is this? Mind, you know, health ambassadors. And we were getting a lot of people. It's like, yeah, I've been trying to get my kid into counseling and we're on a waiting list or they didn't connect. And this just looks like a program that would be really helpful. So having parent buy-in is obviously huge. They got to get the kids there, right? Whatever your right. kid signs up for is what parents sign up for um, until they can drive. Um, but it has been life changing. It has been life affirming. It has been life saving. Again, uh, those things just kind of kind of come up to me, and the impact that we've been able to make with with these teens has been immeasurable. It really has. Well, I I think back to little Kimberly getting thrown into the pool and, um, oh. you know, you being able to, in that moment, you were swimming and you were fine. And then you had an external voice and nothing against your mom, but you had an external voice that yeah. said, you know, you can't do that. And now I think of, but what if you had been armed with someone like you now who had told you, you know what, Th the water's okay and you can swim yeah. and here's how you do that. And how, how could have that story been different for you in your life? And now I think about the tens and hundreds and eventually thousands of people that you can reach that you can make that experience for them different. And that's an incredibly, yeah. incredibly powerful thing. Wow, it is. Thank you. I never kind of drew that, um, that connection, but yes. Yeah. Thank you. It's, um, yeah, I could have went under, I could have drowned. I could have just like sucked in all the water and, and, uh, you know, not be here right now. Um, it was meant, it was, it was meant to be, um, which is sometimes hard to not verbalize, but to realize that all the, the pain and the, the setbacks and the failures, um, that you go through. And then you look at something like this program that has made it all worth it. You know, what if we didn't, what if we didn't try? What if we said, oh, no, you know, um, what if you we could waste so much time with, with, with what ifs. Um, but I think it is important. Like you don't want to spend a lot of time in the past, right? Spending time in a past that you can't change leads to depression. But I think it's important to reflect back and so important. And I thank you for, for wanting to have this conversation with me, for making that connection back to KOA camp when I got thrown in the water and now what I'm able, you know, what I'm able to do. Um, who somebody asked me if you could, if you could go back and tell your younger self, like if you could have a conversation with your younger self, what would you say? Gosh, I don't know if I'd say anything. If I, would that change where I am right now? Because I'm very, very happy with where I am right now. And I'm excited about the future. You know, there were some bad decisions. I'd probably say, don't go out with him or, you know, but when you, when I look back and think, would I, would I change anything? I guess that would be, I would say no, because if I change something, would it, would I not be here right now? And those are the things you, you know, those are those unknowns, like the mystical things that, that you don't know. Would I still end up here or would I, would I be somewhere else? So, um, other than believe in yourself, which I do, I have a wonderfully supportive family that no matter what I showed up and said, oh, this is where I'm working today, or this is what I'm into now. And they're like, okay, Kimmy, <laughs> you know, it's always like, a, a, okay, Kimmy, we're, we're proud of you. You do it, you know, 
Um, family support is amazing. We do see a lot with the ambassadors that we've had the last three years. Um, there's, there's, there's not the kind of support that I grew up with. You know, it's, it's, it's it, our generational, it was deep. It was my mom, my sister and I, my grandparents, her parents, and then my grandma's mom all lived in the same town within a few miles of, of each other and an and, and aunt that lived right next door. Um, kids don't have that these days. You know, at family so spread out or polarized or divided. That's that's a whole nother podcast, right? Um, the kids are looking for support and connection. And we're able to give that to them in a way. Even though it's structured and it's a program and they're, you know, so a lot of them sign up like, I want that money. I want that $500. I want that $500 award at the end, you know, and then they find out is so much more, which is kind of what happened with me with yoga. I went for a Groupon and now look, <laughs> you know what I mean? This is, this is where I am today. Um, after doing the teacher training and meet, meeting Valerie at the studio that I did my training at, that I, that's my home studio. That's where we take the kids. Um, it's, it's, it's magical. I don't know how, I don't know how else to say it. It's divine. It is. Um, yeah. Well, as we, as we wrap up our conversation, I, I think that the work that you're doing is incredible. And I know that sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, we can be our, we can be hard on ourselves and finding that support can sometimes be difficult, but I hope I can at least be one voice that says, keep going because I think the work that you're doing is important. I think that it's meaningful and mm -hmm. I, I get chills just thinking about the impact that you are having and that you will continue to have. So keep going. If, if people Thank wanted you. to learn more about you, learn more about the ambassador program um, or get in contact with you, what are some ways that they could do that? Yes. So um, I have a website um, at it's Kimberly's Yoga and More, and it's all spelled out. Um, Kimberly Jogan Moore at gmail.com is my email. Um, and also at Kimberly Yoga and Moore on Instagram or Facebook. That's where I do posting on ambassadors. Um, the Urban Zone. I think on my website there is a link to the Urban Zone and the I'll double check that. Um <laughs> and our Mind Health Ambassadors program. Again, we're entering into our third year and we have an amazing group of of ambassadors and training. And we're just so excited. I mean, every year we're excited, but we're just, we're getting more and more excited because this is the point where integration is actually becoming a part of the program. The pro program keeps growing. Side note, every year parents ask, can you do this for us? We need mm. something like this. Wow. Oh. <sighs> And so we're, so we're working on that. We've been asked, can you do it on a, on the, on the end of middle school? We need to get them younger. You know, we're like, okay. Um, so one of our goals is to become a national training center. Um, we have our curriculum, um, and we're working on putting it in a, together in a way where we can have people come in and do trainings and learn our, our program and take it and, and, um, apply it to schools, community centers, church, you know, wherever the need is. Um, but to also go out and, and do training. So that's something that, you know, that's, you know, in, in our, in our future and our plans. Um, and, um, yeah, we're a grant based program. We are nonprofit. <laughs> so, um, donations are always appreciated at the, at the urban zone. Um, and again, I'll make sure that there is a link on my website. Um, but yeah, if they just want to follow me on social media, they can direct message me, um, schedule an appointment for a Thai massage. They're amazing um, body work and assisted stretch um, and just lots of lots of great things to come. I have a retreat coming up. Um, we just completed the website. It is a Queens of Color retreat and we're going to Morocco in 2024. So we want wow. to take 
black women and take them to Morocco to um, experience, to transform, to grow. It's called the Queens of Color Wellness Quest. Um, and that will be on the website too. I'll make sure that's updated in the next couple of days because we just got the website ready. So, you know, lots of exciting things um, that have been in the works for a long time. It's just kind of starting to all kind of come come together. So hopefully we'll we'll be shining. I love it. It's amazing. Well, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for sharing your work. And again, um, keep going. Keep going. <laughs>